Good morning everybody and welcome to um, the Flatty YouTube channel. This will be my sec second video and in this one I'm going to show you um, how you put on the first two or three very subtle dyes and you capture those within the wax. Um, I will do something on colour specifically later on and I am intending to do quite a big section on how my process works because I refer to colour plans a lot and you probably want to know what those are. If you want to find some information um, until we put the videos up, please go to Jude's Teaching Space, at face, um, at, which is a Facebook page, and you should find lots and lots of notes. Just request membership and I'll accept you straight away. So, after putting a very, very pale dye in a couple of areas which are not the greens, and so they need to be just treated a little, little specially, I've just put a tiny bit of dye on of purple, which is going to indicate the path and I'm now capturing that using the colour, um, using my colour plan um, and capturing the, the absolutely lightest of purples and lightest of blues um, before I start doing some major dyeing. Of course I always check my work and make sure that I've sealed it all in. As with all my boutiques, um, my colour plans are the most important thing, uh, especially early on when you really don't um, have any reference on the cloth. So, as you can see with this, I'm referring to my colour plan, which is on tracing paper, identifying the shapes that need to be coloured into the colour that the plan prescribes, and then waxing it in. Also, once I've finished, I, make sure I check my work and make sure that all of the seams um, and all the wax is penetrated correctly. So, checking your work all the way through, make sure you haven't got any holes left and there aren't any, any mistakes or any areas um, that uh, aren't quite penetrating the cloth as much as possible. I use the window um, to shine the light through because sometimes that shows where the problems are much much better than when it's just lying on the um, on the surface with the light coming from one source. Um, so once I've got my um, my first wax on, the first thing I then do is want to start to build up some colour. You start off by very um, you start off by using very pale colours um, and as you go on you can build those colours up to more intensity. It also helps early on if you just put a few colours on or areas which will give you a, an indication of where later on um, uh, certain things are. So for instance at the moment what I'm trying to do is just put a very, diff very small line of turquoise across the top of the tree line. That will actually indicate that there is um, a band of trees behind the main bulk of the trees. Um, the turquoise is a cold colour. Once that goes slightly green it'll knock that right back and it'll show that it's in a further distance. Blue tends to help to push things backwards. Um, so um, as you'll, if you look at landscapes, you'll see that the um, uh, the the backgrounds are a much bluer tone. So this is part of what I'm doing here is just adding a few little little um, areas. It helps you warm up to getting your dye done, dyeing done, because you've got to be brave when you do it. And I tend to not be brave to start with. So what I'll do is I'll either put the dye straight onto the cloth, the dry cloth, or quite often I'll do, as you can see here. Um, wet a particular area, pop a bit of dye there and then just you do, do some blending. Um, you can see here that I'm using a paintbrush but in the early days and you'll see early days of boutique and you'll see this coming up that I can I also use a plain washing up sponge. It's a great way of getting big strokes of washes in um, without too many um, divides or watermarks and things. But what, I, what I'm doing is using uh, plain old water um, and um, the dye that has the chemical water in it and just literally just playing around very similar to what you do for a watercolour, playing around with putting some tones, some colours on um, and as they're very pale at the moment, um, you can hide the mistakes if you make some, and often I do. Um, once you get to the deeper colours, a lot less easy to hide them. Uh, so you're kind of tiptoeing into the colour, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, and you really just want to enjoy yourself. Um, as long as the colours are pale and you are only putting dark uh, cold colors on a cold area and warm colors on a warm area because crossing the two over will always give you a sort of olive green which is uh, a boutique a boutique artist's worst nightmare so you just keep the warms and the colds away from each other when they do cross over they'll tend to give you a, a more of a gray tone and they, they knock back the color a lot so 
um, that's something to be aware of. And I test the colours I've got on the sides of, um, of my batik. It gives you, it's just so that you don't commit to it on the actual batik, um, because some colours can be deceptively strong, although you think you've done something very weak. Um, that actual dye is is far too strong, so you just double check before you you put it onto the cloth. And then using a variety of brushes. At this this moment, I'm using one of the finest brushes because I just want to put in some pinpointed areas of colour. And again, I'm using my um, colour chart that I've got to see where those colours are in respect to the to the line drawing, and can actually make it reasonably accurate. But obviously, you do need to bear in mind that your your dyes will bleed from where you're putting them on um, because they're soaked into the rest of the cloth. Uh, a good way to uh, keep the colours tight is to put it straight onto um, dry cloth as I'm doing there. But in other areas where you really want to start to blend two colours together on, on the fly, on the cloth, you can start to use much bigger brushes and you'll see that later on when I start to have real fun. But to start with it really is just putting a few small details and highlighted bits of colour in which will actually make the thing zing um, later on and although you'll be, often you'll find one of my boutiques may look like it's all the same colour if you look at it in detail there are splashes of other colours throughout. For me that helps it come to life um, and become less flat. So, in order to make colours, I've got a chemical water, which is just plain old water with some soda ash in it. What I'll then do with that jug is I'll then use a very small amount of a particular dye colour, add some chemical water to it. If it's too strong, put some more chemical water in another pot and just put a tiny bit of that dye in until you get the right consistency. I then test those on the side of the batik on the cloth to see uh, exactly how strong it is. Uh, with this one, that's way too weak. So I'm adding a little bit more of, of the original dye I mixed into the diluted dye. And once I've got the right consistency, I can then use it on my batik. So there's not much pink in this, but I'm going to put a little bit of pink in because, again, the world is not always um, within the color streams that we actually see. It also helps to make it a bit more vibrant. So now I've built up what I think is to the right color. I've tested it, it looks right. Um, and I'm now going to put it into a few places where um, I want it, shown, want it to, to be captured. Uh, very, very tiny places. Uh, but there will be going into where the tarmac is. Some of the pink with the purple will go a little grey, but as this is tarmac, uh, I don't mind that, and it actually just gives a variant to the, um, um, to the surface and adds some more interest to it. So as you can see, when the dye, when the cloth is wet, it's with these very light colours, it's quite hard to see what's going on. Um, when it's dry, you'll see it better. Uh, what I... Um, do tend to do is if I have uh, an eye journey that I want. Um, an eye journey is how you are encouraged to your eye to journey around a batik or a painting to gain as much information as, as is as possible in this quick amount of time. Um, this brings the image to life because you then interpret it in your brain and fill in the details yourself, which actually makes uh, makes it become quite magical. I, I well, that's how I see it. So when I come to putting in the waxing over the dyes, I am using at this stage my tracing papered colour plan specifically to look at where um, uh, I need to capture that colour. Um, in this one, there is a plant that has a slightly different colour to it that comes that is it appears across the sort of the middle section. I'm actually highlighting that because it will bring your eye to the naturally to bring your eye to the path to and that's part of the eye journey. Um, but also it, it adds a layer of, of complexity and differentiates the different foliage which will make a lot more sense as it goes on and actually bring the thing again far more to life. So at the moment everything is very subtle, but at the end those subtleties will be appreciated and you, and you will enjoy seeing your subtleties as well as your great big bold blends.
I'm now using my washing up sponge. I'm having a lot of fun now because I'm getting into the green. So what I've got is I've got a tray of water and I've got a tray of diluted green dye. Um, to, it's, it's quite pale, but it's, it's, you know, it's, there's a little bit more punch to it. Um, I'm using a sponge and the brush to do similar effects as I've done before. But this time I'm looking to add, um, there are two different greens I think I'm using and I'm looking to get some blending going. So you can see there when it's, uh, um, the, the blending starts to appear. Once it was dried, I wanted to actually differentiate a tree that's actually further forward than all the rest. So I've gone back to it before I do my, my, my second wax and just upped the colour on that particular area a little bit because it will pull it forward from the trees in the background. Again, using my sponge to either wet the surface so I can get some nice blends or just just really to, um, as I, I use it as a, almost like a sketching tool. It identifies where the colour that I've got, I want to put it on. At this stage, because the colours are diluted, you can do this as it goes further on. I'll be not using my sponge and I'll be using predominantly um, the small brushes. But at this point, you have, is the time to start enjoying just watching how the coloured dyes on the cloth will blend um, and then sink into the cloth and, and they capture some wonderful gradients and some colour mixes. And to me, that's the whole fun of critiquing, is capturing all those organic um, colour blends that, that, that happen magically on your cloth. Um, you can also then start to be a little bolder. I'm putting some quite dark dye, or it looks quite dark dye on the bottom. It's actually a slightly different green, but I'm looking at my color chart and seeing where the dark is in, in the greens of the, of the grass. And so I can afford to be a little bolder in that area, as most of them, I won't be waxing that in at the moment because, the color, because I haven't got to that darkness of color yet. I'm trying desperately, and as I go along, I keep overgoing, overgoing with the paintbrush because basically I'm a coward so I start off by by doing as little as possible in committing to color but once I get into using that sponge and that brush you can't stop me and as you can see here I'm having a whale of a time um, putting some um, some color onto the cloth which um, which just makes me happy seeing color on cloth it makes my day um, and um, I spend a little bit of time doing this. Sometimes I'll let it dry and then I'll add some extra, extra dye. Other times I get it right first time. But I kind of build it up and build it up. Um, and as I go further and further on within my boutique, I also become far more confident and therefore I can become, I get far more punchy colours coming out later. But I start off slowly and, um, and with light colours so that I can get the structure in place uh, without making too many mistakes and the mistakes, certain mistakes means you have to throw the thing away. And I hate doing that. So um, I, I start off quite timidly. But you can still have fun and as you can still, you can still get some, some wonderful vibrant mixes going on um, on your cloth um, but at, at the end of the day at this stage just enjoy yourself keep them all light and just get those brushes going and that sponge going and just marvel at the way that it blends because that's what that's what I find most fun in doing batiking One of the great best tools that I have once I've got I've gone mad and I've put loads and loads of dye on and lots of excessive water for the blending is basically just an old face towel, uh, face flannel, uh, face towel, whatever you want to call it. Um, get, keep them regularly clean so they go in the washing machine um, and they're great for actually pulling off bits of dye that you don't necessarily want while it's wet. Once it's dried you can't get them off. Um, but equally so just taking away any excess water that's around um, and once that's done then you just leave it to dry. <laughs> well that's me done for the day. Oh that was my coffee wasn't it?